Welcome to Dr. Dave on Call. I am thrilled for this episode. Uh, we are going to be talking to New York Times bestselling author John Barry about his book, The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, the study of the 1918 pandemic. It is uh, definitely applicable in terms of how the parallels of the great influenza pandemic of 1918 is to the COVID-19 pandemic now. We're talking over 100 years have gone by, but there are so much that we can learn from the influenza pandemic 100 years ago um, to today's COVID-19 pandemic. The 1918 pandemic the reason why it was called the Great Influenza Pandemic, it was just absolutely devastating. Upwards to 100 million people died in the world. Um, in the U.S., it was about 650,000, which if you, you know, stratify what the world population was back then, it was it was a very large percent of people, especially here in, the, in America, too. Um, but more specifically, there are a lot of parallels in terms of governmental response, uh, misinformation campaigns, as well as like the explosion of scientific discovery during the early 1900s um, that, that helped really pave the way, not only into helping, uh, you know, navigate the influenza pandemic, but just so many scientific discoveries that catapulted us into modern medicine into today. So, Today, we're going to discuss with John his book and the parallels of the 1918 pandemic to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we hope you enjoy. Um, if, you are, if you are enjoying our podcast, too, I'm going to plug this here, Apple and Spotify or wherever you download your podcasts, go ahead and, uh, and write a review for us, too. If you are watching us online on YouTube, we have a YouTube channel, Dr. Dave on Call. Feel free to give us a like and subscribe, too, as well. So let's get to it. We are excited to have John. For the show today on Dr. Dave on Call, we have John Barry. He is an award-winning writer and New York Times bestselling author. His 2004 book, The Great Influenza, the Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History, the Study of the 1918 Pandemic, was honored by the National Academies of Sciences as the year's most outstanding book on science and medicine. John Barry has published uh, numerous articles, and even in high-impact journals such as Nature, other publications such as Politico, Washington Post, Time, Newsweek. He's a regular guest on many domestic and international broadcast news network programs, and we are truly excited to have Mr. Barry on our show today. Firstly, John, let me say I'm a huge, huge fan of your work, and as a physician, your account of the great influenza pandemic of 1918 was extremely vivid uh, and very frightening, too. Um, First, if you don't mind, just tell us a bit about yourself and how you became passionate about the 1918 influenza pandemic. Well, was, when I was a kid, there were only two things I really thought about doing. One was becoming a writer, and the other was uh, biomedical research. Uh, obviously, I did not pursue the latter path, uh, though I have ended up writing about it. The, the, the odd thing about the influenza book is almost an accident. I planned to, my earlier book, Rising Tide, had a chapter in it about uh, uh, the home front, really, about in World War I, which culminated in one of the, you know, huge chaotic events in 1919, an attempted assassination of the Attorney General and of J.P. Morgan. Uh, race riots in, in several dozen cities, uh, almost a race war in Arkansas, uh, general strike in Seattle, police strike in Boston. Anyway, uh, I had planned to write a book about the home front culminating events in 1919. Uh, always been interested in the pandemic and that ended up becoming the entire book. And I never went back to the uh, home front book. Uh, you know, when I, when I started, I thought I could do it pretty quickly, actually. Uh, ended up not so quick, about seven, seven years full time. During much of that time, more than half of it, I was very sorry that I had ever embarked upon it. Uh, but right about the five and a half year mark, 
started to come together. And, you know, obviously I was pretty happy with the result. So it seemed to be other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you outline with such clarity this emergence and transmission and control of many actually infectious diseases in the early 1900s, specifically the flu. Um, And if we take a look at the flu of 1918, you know, we can see distinct aspects that contribute to the overwhelming mortality rate. You have naive immune systems, difficulty with physical distancing, you have improper hand hygiene, lack of PPE, even the lack of anti-infectives too as well, which really significantly overwhelmed the hospital capacity and resources. And, you know, tying it to our response to COVID-19, you know, we've implemented aggressive physical distancing, stressed hand hygiene, proper PPE, and that's really limited, you know, uh, you know, this, this transmission and flattened our pandemic curve. So we're seeing some improvement in our case numbers. Where do you see the COVID-19 pandemic evolving over the next year as we reflect on the 1918 influenza pandemic and it's, it's devastating second and third waves? Yeah. Um, Probably 95% of the population remains susceptible to the disease somewhere around there. It was just a study that came out. I can't remember if it was yesterday or, or this morning. I, I was just looking at, I hadn't read the actual study, um, just a press report about it, uh, that it said the physical distancing, and the, which is the most important action uh, that's taken is social distancing. Um, you know, the hand wash and masks are important, but not as much as social distancing that it prevented in the United States uh, over 60 million cases so far uh, with a concomitant death toll that, you know, would have dwarfed the 112,000, whatever it is today. Uh, so those things work, you know, in, and but in, by the same nature, the fact that it worked means people hadn't been exposed to the disease. So you still have this huge over one, you know, over 90% of the population that's still susceptible to it. Um, and what that means, it's really unpredictable what's going to happen. Uh, if we maintain a uh, good discipline on things like social distancing and, you know, hand washing and masks, uh, and staying home when you're sick, when you have any symptoms at all, stay home. That's hugely important. You know, then, then we have a good chance of keeping this in a box. Uh, there will certainly be more cases and more deaths. Uh, but number one, they won't be anywhere near enough to overwhelm the healthcare system. Uh, and num- number two, uh, the more we stretch it out, the more likely we'll have the therapeutic drug and the closer we get to a vaccine and so forth. However, if we lose discipline and get really sloppy on uh, these various measures, then we could be in for it. So it's it's difficult to protect. It really depends on uh, how seriously people continue to take it and uh, what the messaging is uh, coming out of... uh, the public health community and the political community. So let's talk about that a bit too, because as you described in your book, you know, the pandemic started in Haskell County, Kansas, but it was incorrectly labeled the Spanish flu, likely because of the control or suppression of the media in itself. You know, Spain was one of the few countries that were actually reporting on the flu in the general media in 1918 What similarities do you find with the 1918 pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic in the realm of misinformation campaigns and untruths expressed in media outlets and sometimes even within government officials themselves right now? Yeah, unfortunately, there are too many parallels. So first, let me say in the book, and in fact, in a scientific journal article published at the same time, I advanced the hypothesis that it started in Haskell, Kansas, which is rural southwest corner of the state. Um, and I had good reason for that, and I thought. Uh, but since the, the book came out originally uh, 16 years ago, there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, since then. And I've actually shifted my opinion. I think the most likely starting point is, is China. Uh, Kansas still remains 
a possibility, probably in my view, the second most likely possibility. Um, there are very good virologists who think it started in France. There are other people who think it started in Vietnam. Uh, I think a late entry into the possible uh, site of origin would be New York City. Uh, it was clearly in New York City at the latest, early February 1918, before it was in any army camps. Um, so, you know, that question aside where it started, uh, in, in 1918, of course, we were at war. There was an infrastructure the government had created uh, that had nothing to do with influenza, but influenza fell into that structure. And it, the government was trying to do two things because it was trying to intensify the patriotism to improve the war effort. Uh, it created a uh, propaganda agency that had ended up having, I think, over 100,000 people who were called four minute men. They would get up in front of every public meeting every vaudeville show, every school board meeting, give a brief speech uh, with the line of the day. And that line was always positive. Anything negative was outlawed. Uh, and it actually, the architect of, the, of that group was called the Committee for Public Information that issued the lines of the day, uh, set out right uh, in a memo that led to the creation that committee he said that uh, there's no difference between truth or falsehood. The only thing that matters is the inspirational uh, impact. So they would lie. They had no hesitancy about distorting and sometimes outright lying. By the same token, uh, again, to intensify patriotism, uh, the Congress passed a law making it punishable by 20 years in prison to, quote, utter right, print, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous use of language about the government of the United States, unquote. This law was enforced. Uh, rigidly, in fact, a congressman was sentenced to more than 10 years in, in jail. Over the, so you wouldn't have anybody criticizing the government, uh, or they were fearful of prosecution. And at the same time, the government is actively trying to put the best possible light on And influenza came along, and the result was you had national public health leaders saying things like, this is ordinary influenza by another name. As you said, it was referred to as Spanish flu. Spain was not at war. The European countries who were at war all censored the press. The U.S. technically didn't censor its press. It was self-censorship, but it was extremely effective self-censorship. Um, this was not ordinary influenza by another name. Much like, in fact, the, the not only are influenza and COVID-19 both respiratory viruses, but their pathology is very, very similar. Uh, the 1918 virus could bind to cells deep in your lungs, so you're essentially starting out with viral pneumonia. Uh, it could infect all sorts of other organs, uh, even had, could apparently seem to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, all these things, COVID-19, we're now discovering is done uh, and can do. Uh, so the, at any rate, 1918 virus was much more lethal than what we're facing now, much more virulent. And, uh, you know, you could die in less than 24 hours after the first symptoms. Uh, and you could have some horrific symptoms, including hemorrhagic symptoms. You could bleed from your, I mean, in some army camps, they recorded 15% of the soldiers had nosebleed. Uh, but more frightening than nosebleed, people could could bleed from their their eyes and, and ears. That's pretty scary, uh, particularly to a layperson. So when things like that are happening, you're being told this is ordinary influenza by another name, 
you know you're being lied to. Uh, and, you know, that had dramatic effects on the, on society, on, on where, where these lies were told. In Philadelphia, for example, which was one of the hardest hit cities, when they finally, finally, at a time when they were digging mass graves with bulldozers, they finally closed schools and banned public gatherings and so forth. Uh, one of the newspapers said, this is not a public health measure. You have no cause for alarm. You know, I mean, how stupid did they think people were? So in 1918, the fact that people were lied to when they're having, they knew that their lives were in danger. Uh, that just led to a to real panic in some cases and a breakdown in trust. Uh, we're fortunately not in that situation because this virus is not as lethal, but it's plenty serious. And, uh, you know, we have been told things that are not true by the White House. Uh, and the effort to put the best possible spin on it is, I think, led to, unfortunately, increased deaths because some people haven't taken it seriously, uh, which contributed to the spread. Uh, and that contributed to people dying who would otherwise not have died. You know, uh, even today, we, we have you know the most cases in the world, the most deaths in the world. Uh, we are still actually growing. The, repro the uh, reproductive number is still above one. So the doubling rate right now is something like 56 or 57 days. That's a lot better than it was when we first intervened back in March when the doubling rate, rate was six and a half days. Uh, uh, but it's still growing. It's still expanding. So let, let's talk about the reproductive number, the r not. You know, we've aggressively tried to push, you know, the COVID-19 r not below one, right? And some geographic areas have done better than others. And, you know, you dedicate part three you know, the tinderbox of the book where you describe military bases as accelerants of influence. And you also describe the catastrophic effects of the Liberty Loans Parade in Philadelphia. You know, how do you feel about these worldwide social justice pro pro uh, protests and the effect that it's going to have on the spread of COVID-19, if at all? Well, it remains to be seen. You know, being outdoor, we're, we're le we've learned a lot more about transmission in the last few months than we than we knew in January and February. Uh, being outdoors is a huge help. Uh, social distancing outdoors. I went to a protest in New Orleans, and you know there were a lot of people there, and yet it wasn't as packed as it might have been at the protest I attended. Uh, most people were wearing masks I certainly was uh, you know that that will help uh, the situation for example in Philadelphia when they had this huge parade several hundred thousand people uh, watching it uh, they were you know closely packed together uh, you know crowding to get a better view of the parade you know as close to the street as you could get they were singing uh, songs, was was fairly standard back then. Uh, we know that that expels virus over a longer period of uh, physical distance. Uh, so I think that was a little bit scarier, more than a little bit. I, I, I think it was scarier than the uh, protest marches. So, you know, I'm concerned about it. I think it remains to be seen just how deleterious that was. I think everybody at the protest was probably was, was certainly aware of, of, of the risk and had been warned, you know, about crowding. So it wasn't quite as closely packed, as densely packed as another kind of protest, I, you know, you know might have been at another time. Um, so there's reason for concern, and, and we will see. Um, you know, it's a tricky virus. Uh, I think every uh, they lifted controls very early. That hasn't happened uh, in other states where 
you know, like Florida, for example, uh, the growth rate has ticked up significantly. It hasn't exploded, but it's gotten a lot worse. Uh, also in Texas, uh, but Georgia remains a puzzlement. You know, uh, we're learning that this virus more than influenza, for example, uh, seems to be uh, have super spreading events and that from SARS and MERS, which were both coronaviruses, we know that uh, some people expelled a lot more virus than others, shedded a lot more virus, which continued contributed to super spreading. Uh, again, much more so than in influenza. Uh, so, you know, it, it, we're, we're still learning and it'll be a long time before we really have this virus down. And I agree with you. I think the next few weeks will be very telling um, to see if there is an uptick in cases, if there is actually a spike in cases too. It's almost as if, you know, this is the experiment science, scientists, you know, would have liked to do, but ethically couldn't do it, you know, in terms of get mass gatherings and, and to see what effect being outside or the heat or, you know, what, what, what PPE implementation with physical distancing would do to as well. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about the second wave because it, during that second wave, you eloquently describe this explosion of non-peer-reviewed scientific methodology. It was widely used, and it, it was likely due to the devastating effects of the flu itself and the pandemic and this desperation to immediately find solutions. I mean, how does the current COVID-19 pandemic um, and its scientific research process compare to that of the 1918 influenza pandemic. You know, we're, we're seeing, for example, just on Friday, we had a retraction from both the Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine uh, on the hydroxychloroquine study because of, you know, concerns about the data gathering uh, b between those two studies too. So any parallels that you can see in terms of this rapid development of an explosion of scientific research we have going on now comparatively to 1918 as well. Well, that, that certainly happened in, in 1918. Uh, and, and so did the, they didn't have the peer review process that supposedly you go through these days. Uh, but if you read the medical journal articles, which I did at least the ones in English and a few important ones in foreign languages uh, had translated for me, uh, you know, there was, everything was tried, every possible, uh, uh, you know, anything that had any logic to it was tried, including some things we're doing now, like convalescent serum. They, they could make vaccines back then. They were quite good at making vaccines and understood the basics of the immune system. Obviously, they didn't have the tools that we have today, uh, molecular biology and so forth. Um, you know, but there was plenty of bad science that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association because people were reaching. Uh, you know, here, the you know, I'm on a Google group of scientists around the world, uh, most, virtually all of whom have published in the best journals. <laughs> there was a comment yesterday that I read about some paper saying they wished that and I think it, it was Nature Medicine they referred to, uh, which is a top flight journal. They say, and one guy commented, I wish they were this lax when I submitted an article on something other than COVID-19 because he ripped this particular uh, submission, which had been published, to shreds. He thought it was ridiculous. Um, and by the same token, getting these ideas out there isn't all bad. Uh, certainly in the scientific community, even at the, under the best of circumstances, people recognize that a lot of these, uh, you know, articles that are published after a thorough peer review process can still be wrong uh, or more likely be unimportant. And, and uh but getting an idea out there, I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, I, I think maybe a little bit stricter peer review would be preferable. But an idea on something can spark somebody else to think of something else um, that could be 
sort of a horizontal intelligence. You see something way over here, and I'm, well, this isn't video, I don't think, is it? Or is it? It's both, yes. Yeah, we're doing the podcast oh, and the video cast. Okay. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would have combed my hair, <laughs> <laughs> at least that. But I would say if you see something way over there, you know, my hand's pointing over there, and something way over there, normally somebody doesn't connect these two things. And yet as soon as someone makes a connection between them, it seems eminently obvious and I think a lot of creative jumps come from someone who connects things that seem to be far apart, but in reality uh, have a real connection, maybe indirect. So, you know, there's just, there, there was an article, I can't remember if it was in Nature or Science uh, last week, uh, talking about the interdisciplinary nature of what's going on. Uh, that people, you know, physicists who never looked at, at these issues, never looked at infectious disease, are now applying their skills uh, in coming up with insights, uh, certainly bringing creative new approaches uh, to problems. And, you know, modelers and programmers that normally work in other areas uh, are now looking at this. And, and, you know, that's certainly a good thing. I, uh, you know, I know for a fact, because I've, at least partook in a tiny way in one very interdisciplinary uh, effort uh, focused out of UCSF uh, and, you know, a lot of West Coast folks, but, you know, in completely different fields uh, who had never collaborated before or looking at uh, these problems. And the result is we're making a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, you know, if we had a couple of years, I think we'd have it solved. We don't have a couple of years. We have, you know, it's ongoing. We have tomorrow. It's not going to be soft tomorrow. Uh, how soon we get a drug that, that works from disappear seems to, to work, but it's not a magic potion. Uh, it's not like penicillin was a miracle drug when, when uh, we found that for, uh, you know, bacterial infections uh, 75 years ago. Uh, you know, if we could come up with something like that, that would be magnificent. So far, there's no sign of it, but we are making progress. Um, you know, I hope within a few more months, we'll have some therapeutics that, that are useful, like in addition to remdesivir. Let's talk about this, too, because I think this is an important point, especially in the realm of vaccines. So we have over a hundred of them right now in rapid development, really with the goal of trying to deploy, you know, COVID-19 vaccine as early as Q4 of this year, maybe Q1 of next year. It's a pretty rapid timeline. And how do you think this current advancement in medicine is parallel to what occurred in the early 1900s where you had this acceptance of germ theory explosions of discovery of scientific giants like Welch and Jenner and Koch and Pasteur. You know, how realistic is this COVID-19 timeline? And and what are you seeing in terms of this, you know, almost Operation Warp Speed, as, as some have framed it, in terms of a COVID-19 vaccine comparatively to the, the 1918 pandemic? Well, you know, remember, I'm not a virologist and I'm not an expert on vaccines. So, I mean, I've read, read, read a lot about them and, you know, but I'm not an author of these articles. Uh, all, all I do is absorb them. Uh, you know, the, so I can only repeat what, what seems to be uh, the basic view right now. You know, you can accelerate it, but chiefly by starting manufacturing process before you actually know the thing is going to work. Instead of doing things sequentially, you do them simultaneously, and that cuts a huge amount of time off wastes a lot of money if the stuff doesn't work, but money is a lot less important than lives. So that makes perfect sense. You know, the efficacy trials, whether these vaccines actually do something is the, is the part that takes the longest, that and safety. Uh, you can't short circuit the safety. Uh, you start giving vaccines to millions of people, so if there are side effects, they will show up. Uh, so, 
those two elements, uh, you know, are, are going to be probably the slowest part of the process. Uh, then you have other limitations, uh, you know, on simply things like uh, syringes. Uh, you have to produce huge numbers of syringes. Um, you have to distribute the vaccine. You know, we're talking about hundreds of millions uh, of doses just in the United States. It's certainly at least 100 million in the United States. I don't know that every American is going to get vaccinated, uh, you know, and, and billions world, worldwide. Uh, so to gear all this up in a matter of a few months, I find highly unlikely when you start looking at the logistics of it um, and you start looking at what we haven't been able to do in terms of simply things like N95s, which is essentially, a, it's not much more than a piece of paper. Well, I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but it's a very, very simple thing to produce. And today, six months after this virus surfaced, in the United States, there are still healthcare workers who cannot get N95s. Uh, if we can't produce an N95 in months, the idea of producing and distributing hundreds of millions of doses of a vaccine in the same amount of time, I just don't see it happening. I hope I'm wrong. You know, I'm over seven. So I'm vulnerable. I'd love to get a vaccine. We are talking to John Barry, the author of The Great Influenza, sharing his insights of the 1918 influenza pandemic and what we can learn from that terrible disease and, and you know, apply it to the COVID-19 pandemic. John, let's talk about, you know, the few key antigenetic antigenic shifts that we had in the 1918 pandemic that likely propagated further waves you know you had that terrible second wave in 1918 in the fall and even a third wave too that following you know uh, in 1919 how do you think this covid-19 virus is going to evolve are there any parallels that we should be looking at in 1918 to now because we, it feels like in a sense we, we have come through this first wave and our mitigation efforts have been largely successful, even though we have such a high, you know, uh, mortality count right now. But, um, you know, all these, a lot of hospitals and uh, re uh, infrastructure are preparing, you know, whether it's increasing their ventilating, ventilator numbers or PPE and just the, the, the structure in itself. What do you what do you sense this fall may have in terms of COVID nineteen? Okay, well, for us, as you said, we have been largely successful. Uh, we would, and I have no doubt, uh, if we were. I mean, simple mathematics. You don't need any deep analysis. When we started uh, our interventions in March, if you looked at where we were and the death toll, say in early April, just about the time at which those interventions began to have effect. We only had 12,000 deaths at the time, and, but we would have half a million dead today, without a doubt, had we not intervened. And as we said earlier, uh, one of the first questions you asked, right, you know, I was commented, there was a paper that just came out that was projecting over six, 60 million cases in the United States. Uh, when in fact we have fewer than 2 million. Uh, that's a huge difference uh, had we not intervened. Uh, in terms of 1918, you know, the influenza virus is a different virus, fortunately. One of the fastest mutating viruses in existence. Uh, if you were sick in the first wave, you had an 89%, up to an 89% chance a better chance, let me rephrase that. It protected, it was 89% effective you had in protecting people against second wave illness if you were sick in the first wave. I actually did a, a paper on that for the Journal of Infectious Disease. It was, its data was a little bit too technical for the book. If you compare that to the best influenza vaccine we have ever produced, 
it was 62% effective. And the worst vaccine we've ever produced is 10% effective. So first wave exposure was 89%. Our modern vaccines are 10% to 62%. So that's pretty good protection. But as you said, the virus continued to mutate and there was a third wave in the you know, late winter of 19, 19, uh, 1918, 1919, started around March. Very unusual to have, very unusual to have two waves of influenza in the same influenza season. And neither first or second wave illness protected against that third wave. That's how much the virus mutated. Uh, COVID-19 is different. The virus is much more stable than uh, influenza. You know, there have been a lot of people looking for mutation rates uh, for mutations. You know, it is mutating much more, again, much more slowly than influenza, but none of the mutations uh, look like it will make it either more virulent or more contagious. Uh, there was a study out of Los Alamos a couple of weeks ago that got a lot of pushback from the scientific community regarding how contagious the disease was going to be. Um, there has been sort of a meta-analysis that came out, I think, last week of something like 15,000 different viral samples and, and didn't really see any evidence of mutation that would affect either virulence or, or its ability to infect. You know, the spike protein, which is the target of most of the vaccines, um, that's a thing that sticks out from the virus and actually allows it to infect other cells. Uh, you know, that seems particularly stable. So I'm not concerned, um, and I don't think anybody's really concerned of the nightmare scenario developing that this virus turns uh, more virulent and starts killing people in larger numbers than it's doing already. If it did do that, if it became a 1918 kind of virus, you know, that would be horrific. It's almost an end of the world scenario. Uh, but there isn't the slightest indication that that's going to happen. By contrast, in 1918, even though the spring wave was generally mild, uh, very mild, so mild, there were medical journal articles that said this looks and smells like influenza, but it's not killing enough people, so it's probably not influenza. Uh, but he, even then, when it was generally mild, there were pockets of virulence where you could see, uh, you know, this virus looks like it really has the potential to be very, very deadly. And, and despite incredible surveillance all over the world, we haven't seen the slightest hint anywhere in the world of that being true of COVID-19, thankfully. So taking this into account as we get into the fall, and we've known that our economic closures, even though the consequences, you know, are, are the viability of our economy, but we flatten the pandemic curve. You know, some government officials have declared that the economy is going to remain open, regardless of whether there's going to be more COVID-19 waves. Um, you know, what can we learn if we have a similar, you know, second wave that's analogous to 1918? Are we going to necessitate closure or are we going to offset that by keeping the economy open while understanding that our likelihood the the mortality rate will increase tremendously well just to reiterate you know i don't think and i don't know anyone who thinks there'll be a second wave in terms of lethality as we were just discussing what there is real concern about is another wave that is as explosive spread in terms of the number of people who get sick. And then again, you end up with a lot of people dying, even with a lower or low uh, case fatality rate. And, you know, that is a real concern. Uh, that certainly could happen if we, if we relax all the social distancing measures and so forth. Uh, politically, I can't see too many states uh, reimposing the closure orders of uh, the early spring. Um, I just don't see that happening. 
almost no matter how bad it gets. Uh, but by the same token, there's no reason it gets that bad. Uh, I think you could certainly get the public, if things started to pick up again, to pay more attention to the social distancing measures, masks, hand washing, staying home when sick, those four things, and particularly the social distancing. Uh, you know, that may relax, but if the disease picks up, I think individuals will start paying more attention to those things again. Uh, also, as we're learning more about transmission uh, and who's vulnerable and who isn't and so forth and so on, I think we can be more selective in closures that we may have to make. Instead of a general closure, I could see uh, a closing of, of bars, and restaurants, for example, and churches uh, while leaving the economy open. And in fact, in, in 1918, uh, they did not, practically no place, in fact, no place I know of, uh, closed down the entire economy. Uh, they, nor did we actually, even when we we're supposedly closed, we were still sent plenty of the economy continue to function. Uh, but they did even less in 1918. They closed places of pu public gatherings. Uh, but that was about it. Now, here, created enormous absenteeism from work, which effectively closed down much of the economy. Uh, but it wasn't from a uh, government mandated order. So in, in the fall, in a worst case, things start to pick up. I do, I, you know, again, it depends on the state. Uh, in a state like Florida or Georgia, I don't think the, the political leadership would be wise enough, would be smart enough to do what I would regard as the right thing. Uh, but in other states, you know, I'm in Louisiana, also certainly a Southern state, uh, uh, but with a democratic governor who I think has done very well, but it's not just, although it's largely been partisan and Republicans tended to follow Trump. They have Republican governors, uh, like Mike DeWine in Ohio, who's been one of the, one of the best, I think, in, in terms of trying to protect uh, his citizens uh, by closing. The, Ohio closed very early uh, and and had, I think, uh, considerable success in doing so. And one thing that might be worth mentioning, I don't think I was ever really an advocate for closing schools. And there seems to be more evidence now than uh, it was it. In influenza, it's almost automatic when there's a bad influenza outbreak, including seasonal influenza, you close schools because kids are super spreaders in influenza. That is pretty much a well-established fact. So closing schools does have a clear measurable impact on influenza outbreaks. And that was part of the pandemic plan that everybody had. So when this disease surfaced, it was a reasonable decision to make to close the schools, even though from the beginning, there were questions about how much kids first were infected and, and second, uh, you know, whether they were super spreaders. And it does seem clearer and clearer that while kids can get sick without a doubt, uh, they are not super spreaders the way they are. And uh, they can certainly spread the disease, but not really any more than anyone else, except perhaps on an individual basis. So I think there's less and less reason to close schools. So in the fall, I think probably those schools would, would remain open, at least if people are looking at the evidence. And, and also to just you know, modeling a different framework of how they operate schools, whether that be, you know, right, right. decreased class yes. sizes, eating lunch in, you know, a staggered schedule, eating lunch right. in the classroom, right. Right. other different right. sorts of changes. All, all those things are given. Yeah. I mean, the universities, I know 
in California, most of them are going to be closed. I guess the state system will be closed. Again, I'm in Louisiana. Uh, the schools here, uh, if the universities are going to be open. Uh, I'm on the Tulane faculty, although I don't teach anything there. I'm wearing a like, Tulane shirt. Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Green Medicine. Green Wave, yes. Uh, yeah. Tulane announced that it has plans to open. It's going to open earlier in August, and it's going to close earlier, uh, uh, I guess, in November than it would otherwise have closed. Uh, again, trying to keep that seasonality, uh, use it uh, to the extent that it'll any good and of course you know make other adjustments as you were just talking about class size and using zoom and so forth john thank you very much our, our guest today is john barry he is a new york times best-selling author his 2004 book the great influenza the story of the deadliest pandemic in history the study of the 1918 pandemic is very applicable to the covid19 pandemic we Truly appreciate your insights into the historical perspective of infectious diseases and and how it relates to today and where we're going um, today on Dr. Dave on call. We really appreciate you coming on our show, Mr. Barry. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. Stay safe and healthy, too. You, too. Thank you. We are really appreciative for John Barry joining us today and giving his uh, vivid account of the 1918 Great Influenza Pandemic and discussing his book and how it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is very eerie to see something that has occurred 100 years later, albeit it's a different virus, um, and the similarities that we're seeing in governmental response, uh, misinformation, just this explosion of scientific discovery. Um, it's, it's, it's really amazing to see the parallels, and we can definitely learn from that. If you have not read John Barry's book from 2004, The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, the study of the 1918 pandemic, please go and read that book. It is absolutely tremendous. It is amazing in terms of its factual accounts, how vivid it is, and it it just walks you through everything from the early 1918 when you actually see the waves of the influenza pandemic and the response and just the the devastation that it had. So it's it's definitely applicable to what we're going through today uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are so grateful for John to come on our show. I'm a big fan of his, and I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that are a fan too as well. We really appreciate you listening to Dr. Dave on call. Download our podcast on Apple and Spotify or wherever you find your podcasts. And if you are watching us on our YouTube channel, Dr. Dave on call, please subscribe to us. Give us a like too as well. We hope you all are staying safe and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic and we'll see you next time. Take care.